is one of the most gifted, most decorated players in the modern game. His legs were massive, his, his body was, was full grown already. He was so strong and fast, and no one in that age group was as good as him. He was a player who was never afraid to confront anyone, from the president of the club to the kitman. Blessed with the technique and intelligence to adapt to any situation. Every, every position he, he could play, and then the only th thing he didn't do was, was my position, so probably could have done it anyway. Three times the uh, Champions League, uh, three different uh, clubs. He was always a key player in, in those uh, moments. In Europe's biggest club competition, one of the world's greatest players. Yeah, not afraid to step out of your comfort zone. In 2003, AC Milan defeated Juventus on penalties to win their sixth European Cup. But it was a night when one individual made his own mark in the history books. Clarence Seedorf became the first player to win the competition with three different clubs. Very proud. I know also that nobody achieves anything, you know, alone. Um, but I'm proud of what my contribution has been in, 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 you know, for all those cups. It's always a journey, uh, and, and every, every cup has had its own story and its own difficulties, you know, during the season. So I'm very proud of, of that achievement. Seydorf and his family were Surinamese immigrants who came to Amsterdam in 1979. Like many before him, the young boy's childhood was dominated by football. I've always played uh, on the street after school, um, playing with the older ones. Uh, so you had to fight through and, and think faster, uh, be tough. You know, the, the rules of, of the street. When I was 10, uh, I did uh, the fam famous uh, open day with Ajax where I, uh, I played and, and, and showed my skills and I was picked out and there, you know, everything started uh, with, with my journey in Ajax and uh, upcoming to my career. His legs were massive, his, his body was, was full grown already. He had thighs like uh, nobody had at, uh, at that uh, age normally and also at my age when I was like uh, 21 or something like that. Oh, I was complete. Um, I think a, um, quite a complete picture um, of, of, of physical and, and technical uh, skills, uh, more than the average. And I have to say that the players that I played with, like Clivert, we, we all were quite strong already physically at a young age. Seedorf was a prodigy. In 1992, aged only 16 years and 242 days, he became the youngest player to make his professional debut for Ajax. I think the most important thing, they handed the opportunity for you to, to learn, and it's up to you, of course, whether you do something with it. I think that that's the whole philosophy of the club, Ajax, is eh? we give, we give uh, players a chance, and especially our academy players, eh? we play in, an, in a certain system throughout the whole club, so that's why if there's injury or uh, uh, players are going to be sold, uh, there's always an opportunity for someone to come in. Everything started there, <laughs> in the very first game. So, uh, but I, I cannot really recall a lot of moments, and it's very strange because at that moment you, you just live it, and not really in a conscious way. Uh, so many things coming at you, you know, your, debut, your dream coming true practically. And playing for the first team of Ajax, you know, 16 years, being the youngest, Played to have done that the record. He played a lot of games in, in that time at that age, so that was his role, you know, to, to learn, uh, also the, to learn on, on the training pitch, you know, with high quality uh, players uh, around him. During this period, Seedorf embraced the Ajax philosophy of total football. 
I've played left back, right back. The right side midfield, I played centre midfield. Central defender. I think even even going game he was, he was a striker. So he was every every position he, he could play and then the only th thing he didn't do was, was my position, so probably could have done it anyway. And that gives you really an understanding of what your colleague that plays in that position or in that area goes through and has to think about or, or you know how we could feel in certain situations. But I, uh, yeah. He came to us as a striker and wanted to play up front. But we didn't work that way at Ajax. We saw he had other attributes. And with the way he was built physically, we thought he could be a defender also. The coach can hand you things out, but you have to really want to improve. And uh, I've always had that, that drive. That determination helped drive Louis van Gaal's precociously talented team to consecutive Dutch league titles during the mid-90s. And in 1995, Ajax reached the Champions League final. They met AC Milan in Vienna. Yeah, there was so much eager from the players and, and, and the quality of, of the coach van Gaal, the, 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 the way he prepared us for, for games or the, way, the, the, the tactics on the training ground, uh, the, the hard work. Everybody was, yeah, it came together. Everything clicked, everything was just uh, the right moment, the right time, the right place, right, right everything. And uh, great motivation, uh, of course, great individual quality. Patrick Kluivert's 82nd minute goal clinched the Dutch team their fourth Champions League title. An explosion after the goal of, of uh, Kluivert, uh, the final whistle and all the partying after that. Those moments um, that have marked uh, that day. It was a long time that I didn't brought home the Champions League and uh, the fans went nuts when we came back. Amsterdam was just one big party. You know, people all over the place, one million people on the Moussaint plane. Uh, and, you know, it was just incredible. I didn't even acknowledge really uh, the importance at that point of, of what you won. Because as I said, you're so young and now oh, we're winning, you know, and it's just normal that you win the Champions League at that moment. Uh, after years, I actually said, well, you know, it's not, it's not so normal to win a Champions League. It's quite special and difficult. Um, and I started to give more value to what we did with Ajax. The victory in the Champions League capped Seydorf's time in Amsterdam. Still only 19, his desire for a new challenge saw him depart to Sampdoria and the more physical game of Italy's Serie A. There was more direct football in, in, in Italy. Uh, so the ball was a lot of times with the strikers and with the defenders. Uh, and the midfield didn't see the ball as much, uh, so it was a lot of running. <laughs> but uh, I learned to adapt to a new culture, and uh, those moments uh, with Sampdoria was really, really the basics. I learned, you know, what it means to survive in a foreign country, uh, especially in that moment, the, the hardest competition in the world. Um, so I was proud of how I, how I managed uh, the year, how I managed to play, and I managed, you know, my personal life outside the pitch. On the final day of the 1996 season, a commanding performance by Seydorf and teammate Christian Carambo brought them to the attention of the newly appointed Real Madrid manager, Fabio Capello. They was, you know, Capello standing, I think, 50 meters from, from uh, away from me and from Carambo, we were just leaving together. Um, and he called us both and he said, do you want to go with me to Real Madrid? And I looked around and I said, are you talking with me? <laughs> I said, yeah, wait a second, I'm just going to get my bag. <laughs> and the week after I signed with Real Madrid. I think in Seydorf, Capello would have seen the intelligence above all else. I think he would have seen the seriousness, the dedication to, to football. I think he would have seen someone that he could trust. I think he would have been very well aware that, that let's have someone in the dressing room who, who I know 
does things my way, who I know is a very good player. Real Madrid needed reviving. Capello changed their system. He played three in attack and used Seydorf as his midfield hub. Above all else, he knows what he's doing and his decision-making is brilliant. I think he understands the game really well. And people look at him and see, you know, obviously a powerful guy. They see a guy that occasionally scores spectacular goals. They see a guy that's, that's very disciplined, but I think they sometimes don't see this is a guy who up here has got the game up completely under control. Eight or nine players were new from the 11. Um, and that was also an incredible chemistry. I mean, we went on training camp and things started to roll immediately. Uh, Capello did a great job, uh, but, but you know, you need, you need some luck in that. And, and uh, mostly it was a team with great personalities that were hungry for a victory. And uh, we won the championship against a strong Barcelona. The crowd, the Madridistas, um, started in, you know, believing in something that, that happened a year after. Madrid were on the rise, but despite his title success, Capello was replaced by German Jupp Heynckes. Seydorf remained a key player and contributed some exhilarating moments. However, Madrid was struggling domestically, yet in the Champions League, it was developing into a very different story. Every time we went into Champions League matches, we gathered you know, together in, in, in a room before the match, and just looking each other in the eye and say, listen, you know, tomorrow is another opportunity to recoup a little bit the bad season that we're having, but we need to be really one. And uh, the team spirit was incredible. With each phase of the Champions League, the last phase gets left behind, but the confidence grows and they start to think, this could actually happen. Madrid overcame Borussia Dortmund in the last four to qualify for the final against Juventus. A tense affair was settled by Predrag Mijatovic's second-half goal. Joy for Madrid and a second Champions League triumph for Clarence Seydorf. We were able to go all the way in Champions League and, and finally, after I think 33 years, bring the Champions League back home. So that was an, that was an amazing, amazing party. Madrid were fundamentally a tough, aggressive and defensive side. Um, and in that sense, the truth is that Seydorf didn't stand out. But in a way, um, that's partly reflected in because he knew how to do the role that didn't make him the star man when it was needed. So it, in a way, it's quite a good uh, for like reflection of Seydorf's character that final, even though when you look back on it, I bet you if you asked 20 Real Madrid fans who were the three outstanding players in that final, only three or four would put Seydorf in the list. But I think if they then started to analyse it, they'd realise that he played quite a key part. I was still happy there, but, but I had a principal issue with, with, the, um, with the president, and, and I just felt that I had to uh, stand on my principles and, 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 and leave. Um, uh, Madrid was, you know, it's a place that's still in my heart. Um, I've enjoyed those years there. Uh, but then when I got the call from Marcelo Lippi and he explained me that I would play behind uh, Vieri and Ronaldo, you know, I said, this seems like a quite interesting project. <laughs> that project brought Seydorf to Inter Milan in 1999. But Lippi's dismissal the following year left the Dutchman marginalized, often sidelined, he had to remain professional throughout. A whole new chapter for me uh, started with, with coaches who had other, other visions, another place, another game, uh, game style. And <clears throat> but I learned so much uh, during those, those years of being a team player, also when you're not on the pitch, focusing on the team spirit, focusing on uh, staying fit because when you know, the call comes, you need to perform. Football's tribal nature makes it very difficult for players to move between clubs in the same city. But in 2002, Seydorf did that. He left Inter for rivals AC Milan. At the end, I said, no, I mean, I have to go and find some new energy, find a new project, some fresh um, 
you know, a fresh new beginning, and um, AC Milan was was the right step. I'm, I've never been a player talking bad about other clubs and other. I've always been quite respectful, and I've never had issues even with Barcelona when I played in Madrid. He's a player with great charisma. A player who makes his presence felt in the dressing room and on the pitch. So his impact was felt in many ways. I was quite fastly embraced by, by the, the fans of, of AC Milan and they never really yelled at me from the other side because I left Inter. Um, I, just, I think, because the people understand who I am and, and, and that I've always done my maximum for, for, for the club. He could turn a game on his own by getting past players, having a shot outside the box, a cross. He was unpredictable and he really did intimidate the opposition. Under Carlo Ancelotti, Milan aimed to become Italy's dominant force with Seydorf in the centre of midfield. Within a year, Milan were in the Champions League final. And on this stage, Seydorf knew exactly what to do. You're very aware of, of the steps to take, you're very aware how to play those games and a lot of, uh, a lot of more self-esteem and, and confidence looking back, knowing that this is, this is what I do when it, it's crunch time. Milan overcame Juventus with Andrei Shevchenko scoring the winning penalty. For Seydorf it was a remarkable milestone. Three finals with three different teams and each with the same winning outcome. Seydorf had made Champions League history. You've made re a record here, the first player ever to win with three different clubs, the European Champions League. What does that mean to you? Paris? That's a fantastic feat. Can we just get your thoughts? So many millions watching. Can we just get your thoughts on that? <laughs> it is fantastic feat. Oh, very special game, uh, the final against Juventus, uh, first year with AC Milan and uh, directly a great season, a great season in the Champions League, it was very emotional. When you look at Seydorf, there's one obvious way of explaining this, and that's longevity. And longevity is about seriousness, it's about preparation, it's about leadership, and it's about intelligence, and that's not chance. It's also not chance that he played in really good teams because he was a really good player who managers recognised would mould himself to what they wanted, would offer them something very clear, very reliable. I think his success is really a testament, more than anything else, to his intelligence and to his attitude. You can win a Champions League but you sit only like 80% on the bench, OK, you can say then you have won the Champions League, but he was always a key player in, in those uh, moments. So I think then you can say your, your influence in, in winning titles uh, was, was huge. And I think that he, he proved uh, every time, every year again. Despite his glittering club career, Seydorf remained an enigma on the international scene. There were 87 caps, but a sense of unfulfillment. The experience with the Dutch national team, which, which uh, has been uh, a crazy relationship, um, not, a never finished uh, business, actually. I heard about other managers outside of Ajax who'd had problems with them. And with the Dutch national team, it was said that he talked too much. That was probably his biggest problem. When it came to the Dutch national football team, he really should have contributed more, played more games. I cannot really say that, that he did something wrong. Uh, just probably the connection between the, 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 the coach at that time and and, and the position on the pitch were, were, not, uh, yeah, were not right for him. Sometimes, you know, you have to accept that it's black or it's, it's white. And he was always 
have to know the reason why it's black or why it's white. And so sometimes it's just black, you know. And when a coach says it, it's, you have to, to listen. Uh, I've missed two World Cups uh, and a European Cup. Um, I, I will call it destiny just to, make, to, to keep it simple. Dutch players tend to be opinionated, tend to be very clear on how they see things. They tend to be um, very conscious of of the nuance of the game, that it's not just, right, put the best players out there and, and you'll win. Conscious of the structure of the team um, and, generally speaking, quite strong. That's a part of, of my career which, uh, uh, you know, was a bit out of my control because you have to be chosen uh, to go and play. And, and, you know, they didn't choose a player that was playing for AC Milan um, every week and, you know, 87 caps uh, without playing six years, I think. So I think I should have been a record holder for the national team. But uh, as I said, things, uh, you cannot have everything. His frustration with the national team contrasted to his club success. In 2003-2004, the midfield triumvirate of Seydorf, Gattuso and Pielo were untouchable. Combining with a ruthless attack, as Milan won their first league title in five years. They remained relentless in their pursuit of trophies. In 2004, Seydorf scored the only goal in their opening Champions League game against Shakhtar Donetsk and played in every game en route to the final against Liverpool in Istanbul. People say it was one of the best finals in the last 15, 20 years. Milan captain Paolo Maldini scored in the first minute. Striker Ernan Crespo added two more goals before half-time. The match appeared won. We dominated 90 minutes, maybe, well, not, let's say 83 minutes. And in six, seven minutes, uh, they turned the game around. And I went quite nice, destiny. Liverpool's comeback was complete when Shevchenko's penalty was saved by Jerzy Dudek. Revenge would come two years later. Despite a match-fixing scandal in Italy, Milan battled their way to a 10th Champions League final in Athens. We had this semi-final, crazy semi-final, where we lost 3-2 uh, away against Manchester United. And we had to win the home match, and uh, we played the perfect match against them in the semi-final. And after that semi-final, we knew that the cup was ours. So when we entered them in the final against Liverpool, we were full of confidence, knowing that nothing, nothing would, would take it away again. Two goals from Filippo Inzaghi proved decisive. It was yet another milestone for the Dutchman. His fourth Champions League medal. Seydorf won a second Serie A title in 2011, before announcing his departure from the Rossonieri at the end of the following season, when he moved to Botafogo in Brazil. It was a decision that would see him exit the club stage on which he had made his name. When I left AC Milan, I left the Champions League too. And uh, well, that, was, that was a difficult, difficult thing. I have a very special bond with it. <laughs> when I decided to leave AC Milan, it was because I wanted something new. I wanted to play uh, still uh, on a good level. And, um, and I have also a new experience, a new, a new challenge. And, and I found the challenge here in Botafogo. Seydorf's Brazilian adventure ended in January 2014. He announced his retirement to become coach of AC Milan. But his playing career will live long in the memory as one of the most decorated players of his generation and one of the most gifted. Football has given me great experiences, uh, many friends, and I've had great, great um, uh, achievements in my career. And, and so I look really back uh, with, with, with pride and, and uh, satisfaction. <laughs>